go ahead and call the meeting to order. If everyone please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next is the roll call. Let the minutes show that Stacey Thornberry and Kyle Arts are absent. We're about to play the boys for the LA game. Next will be the approval of the agenda. Where's my Heather? Discussions or questions? Is there a second? Aye. Second by David. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 3 0. Next is a spotlight report from Jennifer Cook with the RTI program. She too is at the game today watching her son, so we have it over here on the TV over here. Thank you for allowing me to present on our response to intervention program. I'm sorry I'm not able to present in person. I'm in Richmond supporting our band, our cheerleaders, and our basketball team. My name is Jennifer Cook, and I'm the math interventionist and RTI coordinator at the elementary school. What is response to intervention or RTI? It is defined as a multi-tiered prevention system to maximize student achievement and social and behavioral competency through an integration of assessment and intervention. In this presentation, I will be discussing academic RTA. Meet the intervention team. As I mentioned, I am the math interventionist for first, second, third, and fourth grades and the RTI coordinator for k This is my fourth year in this role and my 22nd year at WBES. Amy Beeks is our first and second grade Read to Achieve reading interventionist. Drake Schenkel provides reading and math support in the classrooms for second, third, and fourth grade. And Jackie Harper is our part-time reading interventionist for third and fourth grade. Even though we do have an official intervention team, it really is all hands on deck. All classroom teachers, special area teachers, and kindergarten instructional assistants are serving our students as interventionists as well. Let's talk about the RTI process. You can see from this graphic that RTI works in a cycle. The first step is to identify who needs help. We do this through universal screening, which allow us to measure growth over time and to identify students at risk of not meeting integrated goals. We take a close look at students who score below the 40th percentile and in the bottom 20 to 25th percentile of their grade level. We then take those students and administer a diagnostic assessment. Diagnostic assessments help diagnose the risk and suggest how the teacher can and should address the needs of those students. After our assessment and identification process is complete, it's time for instruction and intervention. Tier 1 is universal for instruction. It's for all students. Classroom teachers provide high quality for instruction for all students. Our next tier is Tier 2, Targeted Intervention. Classroom teachers still provide the high-quality core instruction for all students, but then small group supports are provided in the classroom with Mr. Sheeple or the classroom teacher. Some Tier 2 students do participate in pull-out interventions provided by an intervention teacher. Our most intense level of intervention is Tier 3, Intensive Instruction. Classroom teachers provide the high quality core instruction to all of their students, and then strategic targeted interventions are provided outside of the classroom by an interventionist. Tier 3 interventions increase in intensity from Tier 2. Once interventions begin, we start progress monitoring. Progress monitoring tools are specific free weekly assessments that allow us to measure a student's 
with its rate of improvement and help us to determine if instruction and interventions are effective. RTI meetings are scheduled for each grade level every six to eight weeks. Classroom teachers, interventionists, special education teachers, administrators, and district office personnel work collaboratively during the meetings. We analyze available data and we use a problem, problem solving approach to make informed decisions regarding our students. RTI meetings are powerful and vital to our RTI program, but the work that takes place between each RTI meeting is the key to a successful system of support. Classroom teachers must provide high quality instructional strategies and best practices to all of their students. Classroom teachers and interventionists must utilize effective, targeted interventions with their intervention students. Everyone must work together and remain flexible in order to do what is best for each and every student. This isn't as simple as it sounds. The growing pains that we are experiencing are real. The atmosphere is heavy, teachers are tired and uncertain of how to deal with the unfinished learning caused by the pandemic. Closing gaps but not getting behind to our current grade level standards is challenging. So what should RTI look like? This is a generic model of an RTI pyramid. If you look at the bottom of the pyramid, you will see that in general, 80 to 90% of students will not require additional support beyond the high quality instruction that is provided in the classroom. 5 to 15% will need tier two in order to be successful. And 5% or below will need tier three intervention in order to be successful. So what does it look like in our building? We just had an RTI meeting on January 11th, so these are the current numbers. We currently have 146 students receiving Tier 2 or Tier 3 reading interventions, and we have 110 students receiving Tier 2 or Tier 3 math interventions. You can see the unfinished learning from the pandemic come into play when looking at our large numbers of RTI students in certain grades. Those numbers definitely seem daunting at times, but we can't waste time on that. What do we need to do right now in this moment? We work to develop teacher expertise we provide support to teachers. We make data-driven decisions. We strive to utilize our resources in the most efficient and effective ways. We remain flexible. We support families. We press on. Even when we are overwhelmed with numbers of students needing attention, <coughs> large class sizes, the insurmountable gaps in learning, the behaviors we aren't used to seeing, we keep going. It's our responsibility. and we leave no student or teacher behind. This brings me to a few goals that I believe are important to focus on. We must support high quality tier one for instruction and the needs of classroom teachers. We must evaluate the needs of our struggling students and allocate resources effectively. We must find new ways to support our families and empower them to take part in their child's learning. Our response to intervention program is strong, but we are always striving to make it stronger. Here you can see our teachers doing what they do best. This is Mrs. Lingle, um, who volunteers her time in the mornings. She does not have a phone room. So uh, before school officially begins, she pulls third graders to work with them in the hallway. Um, this is Mrs. Woodward in a first grade classroom. The 
is Mrs. Trevor, working in one of her tier three reading intervention groups. This is my math classroom. We have Mrs. Watkemeyer working with her fourth grade students. Mrs. Wright's kindergarten class. Another picture with Mrs. Lingle. Mr. Shingle working in a fourth grade class. This is Amy Hinks, our Ready to Achieve teacher. And Mrs. Bach working in her second grade classroom. Thank you for letting me present and understanding that I couldn't be here in person. Mr. Patterson has agreed to answer any questions you may have or feel free to email me. Thank you for the decisions you make and all that you do for our students at Walton Verona Elementary School. Board members, I just, after sitting in on those RTI meetings recently, uh, I just thought it would be beneficial to review the use of the process that we're using to catch students up. I was extremely impressed by the efforts of the elementary and, and how they are using time efficiently before school, after school. Uh, they're using every second of the day, focusing on individual students. During these meetings, they literally look at the progress of every single student that is in the RTI program, whether they're tier two or tier three, to look at how those students are progressing. They celebrate how the student exits the program, communicate with parents uh, on a regular basis, and I was, I was just very impressed with that. And I would point out on the slide uh, that Jen put together for you, if you look at the numbers of students that are in the RTI program, what you will see is while there are a lot of kids, what you will see is those numbers continually decrease. For example, uh, in reading, there are 44 first graders, 32 second graders, 27 third graders, and 12 fourth graders. So as students matriculate through the system, the numbers of kids that need RTI decrease, which is what we want to see. So I was just very impressed with the work that we're doing, and, and it's not just the elementary. All of our schools uh, do a good job of focusing on kids' uh, needs on an individual basis and providing them the support that they need. So. Just wanted to share that snapshot with you and certainly appreciate uh, Ms. Cook putting that together and, and you know, building the presentation uh, for you this evening. So my only question would be, I'm curious to know how many students overlap um, for the reading and for the math? Do you have do you have that specific data? I don't have the specific data. I could get it for you. Um, it's it's not as much as you would think. Okay, um, that's what I'm wondering. Right, yeah, so, um, and there isn't really anything that we could point at that says a kid, if he's, you know, falling this low in reading, he's probably going to be in math. We have some of our highest readers will be in our math intervention, um, and vice versa. So, uh, you know, like Dr. Vick was saying, like, we look at each kid individually, and we talk about, you know, what is going on for just that, and then we'll go over and look at just reading. Um, but one thing that I would add that we do that she didn't include in that is we have something that we instituted last year or two years ago called a watch list. So there's even another group of students that isn't in that chart that we are keeping an eye on where it's like they're right on the cusp of maybe needing interventions. Uh, and we'll even talk about those kids. Do, do we need to, you know, maybe increase the interventions for them and move them to a tier two or Let's see how they're doing. Um, but the one thing that I really love about our school is that there's, in, in a good way, no kid can hide. Um, and Jen leads that charge in just an absolutely excellent way. But I can get you those numbers if you want to know how many of them are. Please, please, we don't care. Go ahead and send those to me and I'll get them to them. Thank you. And I just want to add thanks for all the work that's going on there. And I know uh, Ms. Cook isn't here tonight, but I just want to say thank you to her very much. I know that the uh, RTI, you know, no, nobody wants their kid to be in an RTI program, but I, I would say that we do an exceptional job with those RTI programs, and it really is, uh, it really is a strength. And over the years, I've seen a lot of progress with programs, and you know, kids go in there, and it's not somewhere that they live. The goal is to get them up and out of there as quickly as possible. And uh, I just think you guys are doing a fantastic job, and I just wanted to say thank you. 
appreciate that. I'll pass that on this case. <clears throat> Moving on, the principal support. All right, for uh, my report for January, it's it's one of those months where we don't really plan a lot of activities at the moment. The weather's so unpredictable and it's kind of cold and everybody just wants to bubble up. But I do have my uh, map winner uh, results that I have there in front of me, so it's very graph heavy this week. A um, couple things that uh, I did want to take a look at. Um, you, you can see there some of our scores when you're looking at this current year in the winter, they're a little bit down. Um, the things that really stood out to me, and this kind of ties into that graph map of the numbers uh, in our RTI program. Uh, I'm looking at second and third grade reading. Um, those are things that are a little bit down for us. If you look at last year's numbers, um, the winter map, we allowed some students to take that at home, um, and we had some scores that were maybe not exactly the most, we, we weren't able to provide the testing environment that would normally be. So this might have got skewed just a tad. Uh, we'll see what happens in the spring, but I think that reading score that we got this winter, um, particularly looking at third and second grade, is really showing us the impact of the pandemic, because those kiddos were kindergartners, and they were first graders, and they lost, they lost that last fourth of the year with in-person instruction. Um, you know, I think there's absolutely a time and place for virtual instruction to be very effective, but for our little ones, it's really, really hard to teach a child how to read from that far away. Uh, those numbers on that chart, uh, I don't have the historic numbers, and then our overall enrollment's bigger, so the numbers are gonna be a little bit bigger anyway, but uh, the number of kiddos in that tier three group is a lot bigger than what we normally have. We have a lot of students that are still struggling with some of those foundational skills. Um, and you know we're working really, really hard to find the best ways to, to meet the needs of those kids. Like Ms. Cook said in the presentation, it's all hands on deck. We are grabbing every spare body we have and um, we're putting in with kids and they're working with them. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a little heartbreaking to see it. You know, you want to see these kids flourish and be better. But we're cracking away at it. I think I have the right staff to do it. Um, you know, but I also don't want to paint in grizzly glasses when, when there's some tough stuff that we're dealing with over there. Um, but you can see the thing that I find interesting is if I jump down to that fourth grade group, those kiddos were second graders. And, you know, the, the thing that I'm constantly preaching to our teachers, all of them, but the first grade teachers hear me all, all the time say, like, I want those first graders being approaching fluent readers when they leave first, leave first grade. That's kind of A1 priority for us as an elementary school. Well, those kids that are in fourth grade were in second grade when that happened. So a lot of those kids that already had that, the kind of the click, um, you know, you all actually you know what I'm talking about, like all of a sudden they're reading. Um, those kids got to experience that, whereas those second and third graders got to struggle a little bit. So we're working with them. Like I said, we've got the team in place. Um, and we'll keep working with them, but I do think it's probably going to be a few years before we're making up the full impact of the result of this, but it's not out of the long run, it's everywhere. Any questions for me? Thank you. Eric? Yeah, I'm going So I gave you guys uh, the discipline of the last three years. If, if you look at it, uh, you kind of throw the 2021 20, data out because that first half of that school year last year, we weren't really in much. Um, so there was 10 total referrals in that time that we weren't in that many weeks and we were hybrid with only half the kids. So if you kind of put the 19, 20, and the 21, 22 side by side, um, you kind of see the difference. Um, for this school year, we were, you know, we didn't start till late August, and we were averaging almost 50 referrals a month, which is a lot for us. Um, you kind of see the numbers broken down. I was kind of surprised at the sixth grade number there when I first looked at it, uh, but obviously we, we had talked about our eighth grade, the older kids having some of the big problems. Compare it to two years ago, and uh, what's interesting is our seventh grade is lower significantly than it was two years ago. And I always said seventh grade is where they went crazy uh, during that 
time with hormones and figuring out friends and friends can change, but the interesting that went down significantly. Um, so those are the comparisons, and we, you know, it's, it's a difference of 40 referrals, but uh, 151 from 1920, we also started earlier in August, so it was about two or three more weeks of school in August to December of that first year, so um, significant difference there with that timing. Um, what I didn't give you, and I did want to share with you, is um, from the time we started really addressing those problem behaviors at the end of November, um, I ran the numbers from the end of November to yesterday, and uh, you know it was 74 referrals over basically less than two months because that includes December. We only had three weeks, um, so while it was slightly better, it wasn't up to 50 per month. I wanted to come back and say, what's it been like since the beginning of the, the, the calendar year? Because we really. I think we did a lot of things in December to address those behaviors. Referrals went up in some areas because we were addressing it and setting a new tone. Um, as of yesterday, we had only had 30 discipline referrals since we returned. And I think that's a good start. Uh, I did deal with a few behaviors today with the older kids that resulted in four referrals, but that was one of those things that has been a long time coming with, with some concerns we've had. But, uh, you know, so. Get it down to 30 with just a couple days left. Um, you know, it's been challenging for the teachers with uh, subs and covering classes and stuff, and they've, they've done a good job. I really um, asked them to make sure we hit those things, stay on top of things, hit the expectations again, and you can kind of see it in the number of referrals. So, any questions about any of that? And we'll have mapped out for you next month. We, we didn't do it until this month. Normally we've done it in December. We waited until, because we started later, we waited until January. Um, makeups are actually in pretty good shape. I might have 10 or 12 kids I've got to get with all the kids in and out. That's not too bad. Um, but next month I'll have some of that data for you. Uh, we shared our students the month and our spelling bee, which was actually won by a fifth grader overall this year, which was something different. So, um, that's all I got for you. Any questions? Number below that. 
Um, I will say uh, one thing that we both commented on, um, especially Mr. Fenning and myself, after working the day this year, um, talking to the kids, looking at schedules, what can we do, making interventions. Um, we kind of, we noticed a decline in the number of kids failing the cores, your math, your reading, your science. Um, English, I guess we call that. Um, which meant we had more kids failing the electives, um, which was kind of different for us, really. Um, so we, we kind of thought that was interesting. And I will say of our 4.3% failure rate this year, uh, our freshman class accounted for 60% of all those failures. Um, when I ran the data, um, I do it in a spreadsheet, sort, filter, you know, kind of takes a little setup to get there. I thought I did. I thought I did it wrong. I thought I had my filters wrong. Um, when I was looking at uh, like our junior class, it didn't even take up uh, 14, 15 lines in the spreadsheet. It was it was a really good. Um, and then Ms. Hester commented, she goes, I think that's the freshman class of you and Joanne celebrated for their extremely low failure rate as a freshman. Um, and then it clicked on me. We did, you know, like ice cream sandwiches or whatever for the freshmen because they, they had a failure rate their first year that was so low. I, I think that's the class. Um, so that's where we are. Um, Mrs. Hester, myself, and Mr. Fang have been working through that list, uh, talking with kids, talking with teachers. Um, is it something that we could remediate a lesson, a unit, a test, or is it something bigger where we need to start them over again in a math class, an English class? Um, so one of the good things about our schedule is we can do that. If a child has failed algebra uh, one first semester, in, or if they have a, a year-long class and their grade is mathematically impossible that they're going to pass, we can put them back into a block starting the second semester and give them uh, another chance to pass that. So utilizing uh, that part of our master schedule, we're utilizing some after school, um, reworking some stuff with our teachers. Uh, sometimes it's a, a ingenuity play -Doh combination. Sometimes it's a um, go to the learning lab, do a little credit recovery. Um, so we, we've thrown everything at that that we have in our tool bag to try to rectify that situation. So that's our, our current state of academics, um, looking at the semester stuff. So moving on to December's ACT, we got our ACT results back, um, and this is Hester. Um, it, it put some stuff together for me. So one of the things that we were able to do is we have those required senior intervention classes. They have to get uh, benchmark 18, 19, and 20 on the three respective areas of the ACT. Uh, after that March or December test, we were able to remove five students from the reading and language intervention class. So that number went down by five. We were able to drop three students out of math intervention. We had more kids meet math benchmark, um, but that was actually their scheduled fourth math class for their senior year. So they're going to stay in there even though they are at benchmark, and that will be their math credits. Um, and then we were able to drop three out of both math and reading. So those kids uh, met their benchmarks. They don't have any interventions. So um, we are we're pretty happy with that. Um, so, on that same scale, let's talk about where we are right now with our numbers. We have 12 kids um, that are not meeting benchmark in reading and or English, and we have 41 students not meeting benchmarks that are seniors in the math. And that sounds high, uh, and those of you who have been here for a while probably think of this high, because it is. Um, and one of the things that that is, is it's reflecting um, a couple different things. It's one, we, we have to work on some math scores. Um, but the second thing is, we have this uh, transition ready status. So right now, 53% of our seniors are not transition ready to be at the end of the year. And that is a big number. And that is a falsely inflated number because as juniors, if they meet the requirements to take one of the end of program tests in the CTE pathways, we give them the test their junior year. KDE said because of the pandemic, we could not test juniors last year. So we had to defer every junior, and we will test them in March, April of their senior year with this year's junior class. So we'll double up this year. So what that did is if, if we had kids that had met transitional ready status 
and they said, you know, my plan is to go to Gateway and I want to be an HVAC technician. I want to take these classes. This is my goal. Um, we would sit down and look at that and say, okay, they, they're transition ready. The ACT is not in their future plans to become an HVAC tech. Is it worthwhile for them to go into that class? Without having them take that test as a junior, we can't have those conversations. So they're in the ACT intervention class right now. So that's why it's higher than it is. Um, and we will make um, big strides the last couple weeks of school because the kids will again take the Coyote test. Um, they will take their end of program test and we will get a lot of kids out of there. I'm happy to get the juniors tested this year so we don't have these high numbers next year. Um, so, just dealing with that. Uh, we too at the high school dealing with a little uh, behavior thing. Uh, I'm a, you, you know, I'm a very calm person 99% of the time and I have just come unglued a couple times on the hallway traffic. Um, so, we are going to fix that. We have uh, purchased and we are instituting a new hallway pass program using technology. This technology makes things better. And the kids will have a website. They can request uh, passes from their teachers. Their teachers have to approve it. They put in where they're going. And we can set limits. <coughs> we can say that uh, this, you know, all our students in the school will get, um, I don't have a number pick yet, so I'm home into this, you know, five passes a week or um, you know, two a day with the max being seven in a week. Um, we don't have those thresholds yet. I gotta get team input and everything on that. Um, so that will go into place. We've had our onboarding, we have our admin training Monday, uh, and then we're gonna roll it out to the teachers over two Wednesdays, and then they will implement it in their classroom. We can track how many passes different students are taking. Um, and one of the other features we can do is if we have two students that really don't need to see each other in the hallway, we can put them on a no-go list, and if one of those students is in a, out on a pass, this other student has a message that says, your pass is not approved at this time, uh, please wait. So that will go into effect um, as soon as we have the teachers trained, we'll roll that out, expectations for the kids, how is it going to work, um, and why we're doing it. So, and hopefully we, we address some of that with some of the seniors and Dr. Baker's round table with the kids. Um, between that and strict, uh, strict enforcement on tardies to class, uh, we're hoping to curtail some of that behavior in the bathroom, get kids in the classroom where we can do some good. Um, so that is, that is going to start there. So I'm sure your kids will tell you about that and how they, you know, demand watching them go to the bathroom now. Um, but it is for a good purpose. And I want to highlight some positives because that's what we're here for. Um, the other day, yesterday, uh, we took a massive field trip. And I, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was a lot of work. Uh, Miss Corstein spearheaded the choir going down to uh, sing the national anthem at the Cyclones game. They did a pit stop at Music Hall and uh, the Cathedral Basilica in Covington. And they did a little ice skating on Fountain Square. So um, the hard part of that thing was is we had to prove uh, vaccination status or a negative COVID test within 48 hours. Um, so, and of course, you know, we have the testing program here that we can utilize. There's a little snafu with our testing provider. We had to show official results, like a lab test result, print off, to get them into Music Hall. Um, and Ms. Lindsay Crumman did a fantastic job working with our provider. Um, what little hair I had left, I thought I was going to pull out on Ms. Borstein's uh, behalf. Um, and also from the music department, we had six WVHS students um, get selected and they will move on to perform at Kentucky All State Choir in February. Um, the names are on your paper um, that I've submitted, you can see them there. But they will go to Louisville um, with Ms. Corstein and Mr. Boddicker to represent Walt Barone amongst the best uh, vocal singers in the state. So, any questions for the high school? I like the ball packs at the end. I feel like when you get to talk to the kids when there's fights or there's issues in the hallway, when they're supposed to be in the classroom, it always blows down the Snapchat. And so that program is the devil. Yes. And so <laughs> they're snapping each other, meeting in the hallway, meet me here, and if they're blocking, yep. I, I mean if you know about it and you can block them, I think that's I think that's and, great. and we can set, you know, fifteen kids can be on passes at the same time. That's it. You know, or we can say we we will allow three kids in this bathroom at a time. That is it. 
So there's a lot of uh, restrictions and dynamics that we can change. I don't know what that's going to look like now, having not implemented it. Um, I'm excited. Uh, the teachers are ready for it. I don't think the kids will be excited. Um, but it's kind of one of those, you made the bed, now you have to lie on it. Uh, when I get watching camera and stuff like that, there's no purpose for a kid to be in the, in the bathroom every, you know, in between every class, in the middle of the class. If you got to go to the bathroom in 15 minutes, you got a medical problem. Um, we got a staff to help you with that, but <coughs> so we need to be in the classroom. We need to be focused on learning. Any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Keep us posted on that. Oh, you'll hear about it, I'm sure. Oh, we'll hear about <laughs> you it. You will know more about it than I will, I'm sure. True. Okay. Um, the attendance enrollment report. Did everybody get a chance to look at that? Attendance rates are good, but they are. Our student attendance is, you know, remaining strong t today. Or yes, yeah, today, for example, it was 95.52% of the district. So student attendance remains uh, very, very strong. Good. Next is the district wellness policy. Uh, board members, KRS 158.856 uh, requires every board of education to review. Uh, the findings of our school's wellness program review. Uh, so you have this information in your packet, um, but I'll just hit some, some high points for you. Uh, at the elementary school, uh, the strengths of, of our wellness program there include uh, a clean environment for the students, plenty of time and meals, uh, staff training, uh, healthy food options, um, areas of potential improvement uh, include uh, possibly some type of farm to farm to school uh, program uh, where we would locally source uh, some of our food that we serve in our cafeterias. Uh, there's also some room, uh, according to this review, for some improvements in cafeteria supervision. Uh, and we are currently addressing that uh, already at our elementary. Uh, an additional accommodation uh, was plenty of time built into the schedule for physical activity for those students. Um, and then I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but you can see some other uh, findings and recommendations there for the, for the elementary. For the middle and high, uh, because they share a uh, cafeteria and food service um, uh, options there, I'll do those together. Again, uh, some accommodations or strengths of our program are healthy options, adequate time to eat, a clean environment. Um, it was noted we have low breakfast participation. However, uh, I would add that since the pandemic, we're now handling breakfast differently. Students can still do what's called a grab and go. We have tables set up at various locations throughout the building. The kids can grab a bag with the breakfast in it for that morning, whether it's a muffin, a juice, or what have you. They can take that uh, to either the commons area or in some types of cases for the classroom. And our breakfast uh, participation as a result of that has gone up significantly. Um, we were also uh, commended for our, our facilities in regards to physical activity. Um, our, our PE and health program uh, was a strong point. Our students do need uh, to learn a little bit more about the presence of presidential physical fitness program. Uh, so we're addressing that. Um, and just some, some additional training for our regular teachers and how to integrate kinesthetic learning uh, into their classrooms. Opportunities in a math or a science class to get students up out of their seats and moving around. There are different instructional activities uh, that will enable our, our kids to do that. The, the middle school does a lot with Kagan strategies, and a lot of those Kagan strategies incorporate kids getting up out of their chairs and moving. Uh, and that's one of those things, especially in the middle school, uh, that, that you kind of need to do because they're, they're, they're still energetic. Uh, certainly at that age. So that is a snapshot uh, of, our, of our wellness uh, review. Um, it is largely a carryover from 2021 due to the pandemic. Uh, so many of those items remain consistent. Uh, but we received lots of lots of good feedback there and we're taking some steps to, to make further improvements. Thank you. Next. Yeah, one, one, oh, uh, yes, sir. I think it was in the uh, the uh, elementary school for area improvement, there was a line about improved communication to teachers about lunch. 
Yes. What does that mean? I don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> have to. I'll have to speak to to Vicky Benton and get clarification on that, but I'll I'll get you an answer. Okay. And there was another one that had to do with um, I believe it was more area sport leagues, and I didn't know if that was just because of uh, COVID situation. It was it was in around the farm to table somewhere yeah. around, but I didn't know exactly yeah. what that meant. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I'll I'll find it. Thank you. Okay, next is the construction report. Anybody have any questions for Jeremy on that one? Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. Good job. Superintendent's expense report. Did we get a chance to look at that? Next is personnel. Looks like we got some subs. That was good. That's good. Next is another, Dr. Baker. Um. <coughs> The board members are, are aware of this, not, not everybody else here may be aware of this, but January is School Board Appreciation Month, uh, so just wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank our board members for their willingness to step forward and receive all the, the positive feedback that, that board members have received since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, it's a great time to be a superintendent and a board member. So I say that tongue in cheek, but sincerely thank you all uh, for your service to our kids, our staff, and our community. And, you each have a small token uh, of, our, of our appreciation to get everybody uh, either a backpack or a, I don't know what you call it, a book bag, I'll say, uh, for our board members with our logo embroidered on that. Um, and I'll go back to the fall of 2018, my first year here. Uh, we had three seats on the ballot at that time. Ms. Schutzman and her class did a, a community forum, which I thought was a great event, <clears throat> but it was obvious during that event that there is a little bit of, of a misconception about the role of board members and the role of superintendents and where those divisions lie. And, and that's just not our community, that's every community in our state and across the nation. So starting tomorrow, I'm going to start sharing uh, just a snapshot with the community every Friday. It's called a, a Did You Know? And this will be information straight from KSVA that deals with uh, board seats and boards of education, for example. Uh, tomorrow's uh, Did You Know piece will deal with county school districts have precincts where board members represent a specific area within that county. In an independent district, all board seats are at large uh, and represent the entire district. So that will be the first one tomorrow, and I will always cite uh, the source on there, and 99% of the time it will be a KSDA material or one of our board policies or or uh, a KRS just to try to, to educate folks uh, on that. Uh, I'm sad to report on another note our, our boys basketball team did, did uh, fall this evening to Bracken County we lost by two points at overtime. I've uh, been very proud of those kids. Uh, our basketball team cheerleaders are our band uh, and I'm sure they represented us very well this evening uh, in Richmond. Um, I just want to take a minute to thank all of our staff. Uh, our, our staff attendance has not been great. We've been below 90% uh, since January the 19th. Today was our lowest day. We were at 82.08% today. Uh, and it's, I'm not gonna, you know, mince words, it's getting tough. Uh, we have folks covering classes uh, right and left not just classroom teachers covering classes that are planning, but instructional aides, in some cases, uh, principals, administrators, office staff covering classes uh, so that we can keep our kids in school. Um, and just, I, I can't say enough about our staff and, and how flexible they've been. And, and it's not been easy, uh, but we are still in school. We're, our kids are still in the buildings, which is what we all want. Uh, so we're, we're hanging in there. Um, and that leads me into uh, one last thing. Uh, tonight is the last meeting uh, for Carrie Ryan. Uh, Carrie's been my administrative assistant for the past three years. And if you're thankful that your kids are still in school, you should thank Carrie Ryan. Because she's working on that at midnight, at five in the morning. Some morning she can't even take a shower before she comes to work because she's getting subs for us. 
So, Carrie's been uh, an incredible asset to me, and she will be missed. So, thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Um, audience of citizens, there are none, so we're going to move into recommended board motions. First, the approval of the minutes from January 6, 2022. I'll make it. First by David. Discussions or questions? Is there a second? Okay. Second by Heather. All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion passes 3 0. Next is the approval of the treasury report. I'll make it. First by David. Discussions or questions? Is there a second? Okay. Second by Heather. All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion passes 3 0. Next is the approval of the order of the treasurer, the bills. Discussions or questions? Have it. Is there a second? I said for you. I'll is there make a second? It. I'll make it. Second by David. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 3 0. Next is the approval of the 2022 23 draft budget. I'll make it. First by David. Discussions or questions? Have it. I'll keep this brief. This is pretty boring. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a pretty simple one. We don't have a lot. Uh, we just, at, at this point, I've rolled forward um, everybody's step. Uh, doesn't include any like salary increases or anywhere. We're looking at between now and the uh, May meeting. Typically, we approve that. Like We'll probably look at it in March, either approve it at the end of March meeting or in April. Uh, it's typically when we do that. Um, so you see at the top uh, revenues, there was only one line that we increased. Uh, I fully expect that we will see both uh, increase in property tax revenue due to assessment growth. Uh, also anticipate uh, growth in seat funds uh, after the new state budget is uh, passed. But I also have been here a lot of years and know never to count on anything from the state legislature to actually happen. Uh, at least a time anyways. Uh, so uh, I didn't include anything there. Uh, and quite frankly, we don't. You know, for this budget, we don't have to have that. They, you know, the expenses will go up considerably between this budget and the next one, and then we'll, we'll have to have those in. Um, you'll see at the bottom, uh, and I've got the numbers there comparing uh, the draft budget, you know, that starts for the year uh, starting in July um, with this year's current, or, you know, our current working budget, uh, and the differences there. And almost all of them are just step increases. So, you know, somebody bumps up a step on the scale, plus the benefits increase. So, you know, Medicare and retirement costs go up by whatever, you know, uh, the percentage of whatever that additional amount was in the step. Um, uh, there are also, I budgeted uh, about 10% increase in insurance costs. Uh, that's due to a few things. Number one, uh, just insurance costs that always go up in general. Uh, number two, our uh, property replacement cost has gone up quite a bit. Uh, and that's, you know, if our buildings value go up $10 million, we've got to cover that, right? Uh, and we're also going to have another bus whenever it gets here. Um, and I meant to call up Chris about that day. I'm not sure when, but uh, when it comes, you know, that doesn't seem like it would be a lot, but it's a $135,000 bus, so it costs a little bit, uh, you know, a few thousand bucks. Um, and then, uh, so we have those uh, there, and then in operations and plan management, there's also like, you know, we, but I budgeted a little bit of like cost increase for utilities because those are all going up, and building maintenance costs like prices for things, you know, lumber. Uh, just everything is up, right? So uh, a, a little bit there. Uh, you can see the uh, the net increase in the budget. Oh, I, I did skip over uh, one item. Uh, contingency fund, like the fourth line down on the expenses is up like 65, right under 65 grand. Um, just, we kind of worked around numbers on that, but uh, we had the ability to increase that a little bit, which is a good thing. Um, and so hopefully we continue to do that. I think for the last couple of budget cycles, we managed to increase that a little bit about Less than 100,000, but it's still a good thing. Um, so at the bottom, you can see, you know, $360,000 also in total expenses that have gone up. And there at the bottom, you can see what our current contingency uh, number is uh, 795,000. Again, it's up by almost 65,000 over this uh, year's working budget. Uh, the percentage has gone up slightly. You know, it's a big number uh, to 4.82%, which is, is fine. Um, personnel expenses are just under $12 million for salaries and benefits. Uh, that's up $231,000, almost $232,000 from this year. Again, step increases in the associated uh, benefit increases. Uh, I fully expect, you know, if we do something with salaries, that number will go up. Uh, I would also imagine, typically, we have a 
position or two between now and the uh, tenant budget in May. Um, and then the personnel expense, you can see we're still, uh, that number went up slightly, we're still well underneath that 80% threshold. And you've heard me talk about it, I think even the auditor had it up on their kind of comparison of other districts, uh, thing that they went over uh, December, whatever that was. Um, so, exciting stuff, I know. Uh, beyond the general fund, um, we should also, uh, we'll have some increases to uh, the building fund just because uh, the money that we put in is based on our local taxes, which is based on the assessment, which is going up, right? So that'll go up. We also anticipate getting fully funded our third nickel. Uh, right now we're getting 25% of that from the state. And all indications are that, like in every version of the budget, that that is fully funded because they're uh, flush with cash right now. So that's a good thing for us. Uh, it adds uh, a few million dollars in bonding capacity, which I think we talked about maybe in another meeting. We've already kind of built that in, assuming we would get it because everybody always has gotten it. Um, but that will keep us on track with our uh, upcoming projects. Uh, food service expenses have gone up significantly. Uh, food costs, and you guys have all heard about that, I'm sure. Uh, I think we've almost blown through our milk budget at the elementary school already this year uh, after we get our January report, and I think we'll be over it. Um, the, the other side of that coin is that we're getting paid for everybody uh, at federal reimbursement rates, which is high. Our revenues are through the roof, too. So, you know, both are going up, so, we're, you know, I think we're, we're fine. I think we'll end up this year in better financial shape than we were at the end of the year last year, which was pretty good. So, other than that, I don't really have. Is there any questions? indication like they're going to continue that program for the kids or are they going to just continue yeah. it? Do we know? I don't know that that for districts that have 65 percent of the students under this lunch, this it's been an option for several years due to the pandemic. Everybody was eligible. I haven't heard anything, any updates on that. Uh, when I talked to Vicki about some of the wellness policy things, I'll see if she's got any information from her folks at KDE. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think that is uh, like a federal legislative yeah. thing, which you know, good luck, right? Um, Right now, we're, we're operating under the assumption that uh, in this budget model that we'll have that again next year. I haven't heard anything otherwise, but uh, you know, there's an election in the fall that may change some things too. But uh, we're already be into that budget cycle before that happens, so. Any other questions for Kevin? Okay. Is there a second on the draft budget? Or is it by David? I'll make it. Second by Heather. All in favor? All right, motion passes. Yeah. Next is the approval of the SFCC Construction Offer of Assistance. Oh, I forgot about that. I, I see that email. Yeah, the email. First by Heather. Any questions or for Kevin about it? Is there a second? Aye. Second by David. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes. 3 yeah. Next is the approval of the 2022 Comprehensive District Improvement Plan. I'll make it. First by David. Discussions or questions? I just have one comment or question about this. Um, I saw in the district uh, improvement plan, like one of the things you're doing is changing the pacing of science classes for the high school students. Yes. Is that something that's in effect now, or this will be in effect starting next year? I believe it's in effect for next year, Mr. Nash. It's in effect. We had to play catch up this year, so we have like just oodles of biology classes right now. But starting next year, they'll take that the structured two and then pick a third. Yep. So we had to make up for it this year by essentially doubling our biology offerings. We had two grade levels to do biology this year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. So I was glad to see that in there. And then uh, by either junior year or select the physical yep. science. And uh, I think that's great and that will help with ECT as well, I think, because just the reading comprehension. Everybody will get two of the exact same classes no matter what, and then they can yep. pick the third between <coughs> physics, chemistry, environmental, yep. uh, human anatomy, animal science. Thank you. Is there a second on that? For David. I'll make it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes three. Approval of Family Resource and Youth Service Centers School District Assurance Certification for 2022 to 2024. Aye. Okay. Heather. Discussions or questions? Is there a second? Aye. Second by David. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 3 0. 
Next is the approval of the Family Resource and Youth Service Center School District Assurance Certification for the Middle School High School for 2022 and 2024. Okay. Heather? Discussions or questions? Is there a second? I'll make it. Second by David. All in favor? Aye. Motion passes 3 0. <coughs> Next, the approval for the authorization of superintendent, superintendent to utilize TRI days. I'll make it. Heard by David. Discussions or questions? Uh, just very quick, board members. Our our legislature, uh, both houses approved in the governor's side, <coughs> which creates TRI days, another acronym for education. Temporary uh, remote instruction days are similar to the NTI days, however, whereas NTI days are for the entire district, TRI days are for a specific school, grade, or class. Uh, so if you have an outbreak in one particular school, you can put that school on TRI. To be perfectly honest, this benefits larger districts to a greater, you know, to more than a smaller district. Uh, I'm asking for your authorization to utilize these days, but I'm telling you, this would be a last result. Um, if we're out of the NTI days, at that point, I have to make a decision between uh, a day that we would make up for using a TRI day, let's say, for the Walton campus and the next day for the Verona campus. I might have to consider that, but it would be a last resort. If we were to cancel school on one campus or the other, it's going to create significant challenges for families with the child care, uh, transportation, and things of that nature. So this would be a last resort. Uh, and I will certainly communicate with you and let you know that, hey, this is something that we have to consider um, before I did that. But again, this would be a last resort and only after we're out of NTI days. We have seven NTI days left, um, and that's my first option. So, and these expire at the end of April? Uh, at the end of June. June. Yep. The, it's a fairly long bill that deals with lots of other things. But at the bottom of page 9 and the top of page 10 is really where it talks about this option for schools. Any other questions? Okay. I was asked, I'm glad to hear the, uh, this is in case of emergency break last day. So right. Because yes. for a district of our size, I think it'll be a mess if we have to do it. Yes. But we're, we're living in exceptional times right now. And would be a mess if we didn't have this option. So um, it, it's it's a tough one, but uh, I appreciate your um, synopsis of how you would use these. Is there a second? I'll make it. Second by Heather. All in favor? All right. Motion passes three out. Next is the approval of the field trips. Yeah. Heather, can I get you to of those? Is there a second? I'll make it. Second by David. All in favor? All right, motion passes three of it. Next is adjournment. Okay. Mr. Heather, a second. I'll make it. Second by David. All in favor? All right, motion passes three of We are adjourned at 7 15.